Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah? Ah, two more. That's very good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very early, Friday morning, <laughs> raining outside, so, uh, so uh, well, merci for being here. Um, and of course, thank you for the invitation. Um, so the work that I'll be uh, discussing is, uh, is called the uh, string base. That's basically a fancy, uh, like in genomics, you always have to give a fancy name to something like that. So it's the, the, the name of the, the, the R package that you, that's behind this uh, methodology. And it uh, stands for Bayesian analysis of RNA seq data. Well, that's just an application that can actually use to other types of data, any high dimensional data in some sense. Uh, and the core of it is that we estimate multiple uh, shrinkage price. Yeah. Um, so, so we um, I'll have a couple of things to discuss here, and um, the first uh, the first part is the uh, is the, the most methodological part, mostly discussing with the shrinkage on how we do that in the Bayesian setting, uh, and that's uh, for details. That's that's published in the Bayes Stats paper, and we also so I'll, I'll be mostly be talking about count data because that is you know it's very uh, sequencing data that's very uh, modern nowadays, uh, and also. There, you need to think a bit more on what type of models you need. Uh, for, the, for the microarray data and other types of omics data that are Gaussian, we also have something. Uh, that is, you know, from a methodological point of view, not so different, the Gaussian case. But in that publication, we, we discuss a lot on um, the, the advantages of this approach for small sample sizes. So that, that the, basically, you will, you will hear that during the talk a lot, that the promise of this method is mostly when you when you have very small number of samples. So obviously that shrinkage can help you uh, can help you with things. And, and in the and the in the publication of the Gaussian case, we illustrate that a lot more. That it's about an experiment that is just uh, a tree versus tree. And uh, sometimes they have these data and you have to do something with it. Uh, so more about small samples in the go uh, in that publication. And then. Um, some, some new work uh, on, on the choice of the prior. So uh, when we when we are in a Bayesian setting, um, uh, you know, I, I, my background is, is, is far from Bayesian. I, I, I do a lot of frequentist work, and that means uh, that yes, I, sometimes it's good to use Bayesian methods, but I want to be uh, sometimes we have frequentist criticism. So I want, uh, for instance, if you think about. Uh, uh, testing problems, then you should think about multiple testing and what does also scrappy rate do and so on. So, and the choice of the prior is very important for in that perspective. So, uh, I'll, I'll be discussing that as well. Um, so, SwingSec is a general purpose method for analyzing uh, multi sample sequencing data. Um, so, the SEC just stands for, for sequencing, so that's, that's, that's the part that deals with the, with the count data. Um, we assume uh, that the data are pre-processed and normalized. Uh, and those of you who have worked on genomics applications know that this is always a big issue. So uh, it's not, I'm not saying that that is not important. That is really important, the normalization step. But uh, I leave it to others to do that. Particularly for sequencing data, it's, uh, it becomes very specific for the technology that has been used. So uh, the bioconditions do a good job there. And I will just be uh, assuming that uh, that it's okay from that perspective. And so the data that, uh, that I assume is, is counts for uh, what I call a relative unit, but that just means we have counts, uh, we have a data matrix, so I'll be showing it later, and each row, that is a, you know what it is, it's a piece of RNA or it's a piece of DNA, you, it has an identifier to it. And, and there's a lot of ter terminology here, but sometimes they call it tags, so that's tag is just a, a piece of RNA that you that, you have, that they have been able to count in the sample, or it's clusters of tags, that means that, that they uh, basically uh, cluster the tags and that count, uh, count the, the total number in the, in the cluster in the sample, or transcript, that's just a gene. So it's just a well-known uh, unit that you have an identifier for and you've counted it. That's how you can see from a statistical perspective. And we have multiple samples, so we can do some statistics. And the task is very straightforward, uh, very common in, the, uh, in, in biology, nothing new. It's downstream analysis, so you want to link the counts to groups or to follow up your statistical inference machine. A very common question. 
And we have some motivational data. Uh, <coughs> first is cage data that I'll be using, uh, that I'll be explaining uh, in a while. Uh, there was the real motivation, and then for, for comparison, we use some standardized data set called the HAPAN RAC data. I'll, I'll be discussing it later on. But just to get some, uh, some feeling what this data is about, so, so you know, I know that some people are not so used to the terminology or are not so used to the type of data. So I'll be discussing a bit, um, a bit over here. And this, this experiment actually so came in from a biologist that, I, that, that we work with. And we just wanted actually to, uh, to analyze this data with an ordinary uh, existing program. And I'll, I'll, be, I'll be discussing why that, wasn't, why that couldn't work here, why, why that wasn't working in this case. So CAGE stands for Kept Analysis Gene Expression. Um, basically, it wants to, it's a specific technique that really counts the, uh, what is called transcription initiation. So there's a piece of the RNA that takes care of the transcription. It's, it's a small piece and th this technique is very specific to count, to count that, that piece. Um, um, and so for each, for each sample that you, that you have. And the data we have, and that this is, there's some terminology here, but it's, it's, it's not so difficult. It's, it's 25 libraries, that's just, just 25 samples, that's how you should think of that. So you just have 25 genome-wide measurements. So just 25 samples that have been put in the sequencing machine, and you have a genome-wide measurement for these 25 samples. And they call it libraries. Yeah, that's, that's the terminology. So each library, each uh, ob observation, if you like, consists of uh, measurements on 70,000 in this case, tags, so three very high measurement data. And it's 25, P is 70,000. Um, yeah, technically these are tag clusters, but it's just something that, that we count. And um, so 25, N is 25, uh, and what does it, does it represent? It represents five brain regions. So these are samples, samples taken from five brain regions that have been sequenced. Uh, you see the names there, from seven different donors. Um, so, um, and obviously the main interest is which tag uh, differ between brain regions, and I'll be referring to that as groups. And you can see the design over here, it's very unbalanced. So here you see the individuals, the seven donors. Uh, here you see the brain regions, and also in addition there's a, there's a batch effect. And that is represented by the triangles and the squares. So this design, the design is very non-balanced, you have a lot of holes. So, <coughs> so in total there are 25 symbols here, right? They, they, they represent, the, they represent the, uh, the 25 measurements, so to say. And uh, yeah, you see there are a lot of holes. Uh, and the reason for that, of course, is, is, is very difficult material. It's not easy to get brain material. The, the, these are dead people. All the seven people are dead. And so they, they get whatever they can get. So it's really observational because, uh, yeah, that, that's what they have to deal with. And sometimes, <coughs> so they, sometimes they, uh, maybe from, from individual five, they have also this, they actually have a sample from on this brain region and this brain region, but it simply failed. Maybe the quality of, was not good enough anymore. So yeah, you have to deal with that. Yeah. So in there, actually in there, they were very excited about this data set because it's considered large, <laughs> 25 samples. Yeah, so it's considered large. So it's uh, statistically challenging. Um, challenging why? Because you have this, you have nuisance parameter like a batch effect. You also have these, um, the individuals that you might want to model with a random effect because, uh, yeah, because uh, there's the there's the variation on the individual level and there's the variation on top of the left, right, on, from repeat to repeat. So we need a random effect, and then of course there's the main fixed effect or the main uh, parameter of interest, the brain regions. So just to give you a snapshot of how the data looks like, it looks like this. So that's after being normalized. So we have a matrix Y uh, with the entries Y and J. I denotes a feature, um, or a tag, but in general the terminology is feature. It could, all, it could be a gene or whatever. Uh, and uh, J is a sample. And you see, basically what you see, that's important. So you have a big matrix, 70,000 rows. Uh, and there's a lot of difference in dynamic range. So sometimes, so these are really counts, sometimes you see a lot of zeros for a particular tag, so for a particular feature, sorry. Uh, and sometimes you see really very positive counts and maybe something can go wrong there. So there's a lot of difference in, 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 uh, in dynamic range from, from tag to tag. And that you have to deal with in your model. 
So this is a snapshot of the data and yeah, you get a feeling of how it looks like. There could also be much higher numbers, but, but uh, those are typically you, we see a lot of these tags with quite low numbers. Uh, well, the data is, that's the data that you, that's the measurement, that's the sequencing data, the count data. Um, of course, you also have the, the covariate data that, that you all be very uh, uh, used to. So you have the XJK. So here then J, yeah, that's just convention. Here J is then the, the rows. The samples of rows in case of covariate. And in uh, and this particular experiment, you would in ANOVA coding, you would have a design like this. Yeah, so very more balanced. You have your groups, you have your individuals, and you have your batch, you have three covariates. But uh, that's just to give you uh, an idea of how the data could look like, so general regression setting. So, so as, I, as I said, being in, a, so being in, a, in a hospital, I have to do a lot of consultation, and the, the beginning of this project was just, okay, they give us the data and we use the software that's around, right, why not? And that's how I can solve that. But as very often happens, then that did work, and we, of course, we have a methodological interest as well, so we started developing something. So there's a lot of uh, software around, which we tried, and I will also compare with that uh, later on. But we saw quite, a, we recognized quite a few uh, shortcomings. So it was not flexible for the data distribution. That means that it was always like Russell or negative binomial. They had no choice there. Um, zero inflation is not accounted for. So what you, uh, I'll get back to this, but. but there are a lot of data rows that have more zeros than you would uh, have with, than you would expect by an ordinary count model. Uh, design sometimes only you could only do two comparisons. Uh, random effects were very often not possible, and uh, that is I think very crucial for this uh, for this experiment. We need to model that individual by random effects. Um, and high dimensionality expect uh, you could either do no shrinkage or over dispersion. Uh, so over dispersion is the is the, is, the, is the parameter of a negative binomial that gives the Poisson, let's say, more dispersion. So uh, it's like the, like the sigma square of the, of the Gaussian. That is sometimes accounted for because uh, people do it. Uh, people know it's very beneficial in small sample size cases. Uh, but we will we'll, we'll be shrinking more parameters. And I'll, I'll tell you later why. And in the Bayesian frameworks, that multiplicity was not accounted for. So a lot of shortcomings and yeah, good for us because we, we, we decided, okay, let's take this challenge and see if we can, can come up with something better with this data, always having this data in the back of our heads. Mm -hmm. uh, so that would, that would uh, of course, the data is good uh, test case. So what is our method in a nutshell? And then I, uh, I'll be discussing later the, the details. It allows for various count models. Uh, I'll mostly be discussing uh, the zero flavor negative binomial, but we could have used others, Poisson, Gaussian, etc. Um, very crucial, it builds upon a package, or oh, not a package, that's, yeah, it's a package, but it's also a full methodology uh, called INLA. Uh, INLA is, stands for uh, Integrated Nested Laplace Approximations and it avoids uh, the, the, the time consuming MCMC, that's very convenient. Uh, it's very flexible in terms of circuit designs it can handle. Uh, we can do shrinkage by uh, estimating multiple prices, <coughs> and uh, we can do FDR. And all of these these points I will I will uh, I will discuss in the talk. So in that, uh, that's this is what it is. It's a basic framework developed by Harvard Wu, who's in uh, Trondheim. He's also involved in this work, and it was published in a GRSB in a red paper for GRSB. Uh, a lot of discussion on it, and it really, uh, you really see that many people are using this in applications now, not just in genomics, uh, a lot e uh, in ecology, uh, economy, you name it. It's, it's very, uh, very flexible. It has a lot of different models that it can handle, a lot of different uh, methodology. And, uh, what does it do? It approximates margin of the series, and the margin is really important. Yeah, I mean, one of the nice things with MCMC is the principle that you can get also the <coughs> series, but that's not in that just approximate margin of the series based on plus approximations. So we have to, to do our job with that. It's fast, and that's obviously when you have 70,000 rows and you want to do 70,000 regressions, that's uh, obviously very important. So it's fast and it's accurate, and it includes the GLM. 
it includes the, the count models that we want, connected binomials, and the binomial that has an implementation on. Uh, so it's really the, the computer, computational engine that we, uh, that we are going to need. Okay, some, uh, some mathematics and trying to, to get this in, in, a, in a general framework. Um, and every now and then I'll get back to the, to the count data. But, uh, the, the, the framework is quite general, so it's not restricted to count data at all. Um, so what we have is a likelihood. So this is the data that we model the likelihood. So it's all fairly common statistics. We have a mean. A mean can be linked to covariates by the parameters, and you can have other parameters like typically dispersion parameters or zero inflation that are not related to the mean. Yeah. Then you have a regression class, and this is just yeah, like like a GLM, you can say this is a uh, regression part where you link the mean to the covariance. Uh, actually, the covariance, so the covariance, uh, they, they can have an I index. That means you can have specific covariance for specific data rows, but for simplicity, I'll, I'll be assuming that covariance is shared by all the data rows. Yeah. So, like, uh, yeah, like individual that I have or batch and those things, and they're all shared by all the data rows. Covariance, and you have your parameters, so these are all vector, this is vector notation. We allow for random effects, so that means another layer in the model, right? So, uh, we allow for random effects, so that there could be some betas that have another layer on top of it that, that says, okay, uh, random effects, so uh, a Gaussian distribution is sometimes square high. Uh, typically, that, that's what we'll use for the individuals. And then, of course, yeah, in the Bayesian framework, uh, all the parameters that, um, that that are not specified yet, need a prior, right? So this, 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 this just represents, this data IL just is general notation for all the parameters in the model that don't have a prior yet. That's how you should, how you should read it. But what's important is that um, the priors are univariate. Well, that's maybe not that even that crucial, but they are shared by all the i's. So i runs from 1 to b, from 1 to 70,000 in our example. And so the prior is the same for all the, for all the that seems reasonable, but that's something that we need in our estimation when you do it. So there's no I on the right side. First, the likelihood, and then I get back to the priors. Most of the talk will be about that. Um, well, this is I, 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 I'll purpose for an example like you because we can deal with many others, but this is what we find. So this is the modeling part. This is what we find very useful for uh, sequencing data is a zero inflated negative binomial. So how does that look like? Um, so it's a mixture of a negative binomial and a, a point mass on zero. So you have a point mass on zero, uh, and basically it just allows for more mass on zero than the binomial does. And um, important to say is that the zeros, there are many parameterizations of the zero inflated negative binomial, but this one, the zeros still take part of the negative binomial, right? So, so it's not like you, you set them completely aside, but, um, the, uh, but so this is not a conditional negative binomial. It's really, the zeros are also playing a role here. And that's important because the regression, so the mu ij, just takes place here. And if you would set the zeros completely apart, they would have no impact on the regression. That's not what you want. Uh, it is because it's actually quite unclear what the zeros means. So that's the reason why you actually want to to have that want to have them to have the, that these have some impact on the regression. They have a negative binomial where uh, the data goes in and the parameters are then the mean parameter, uh, like in the Poisson, and then the negative binomial has an over dispersion parameter, right? That makes the that makes the uh, allows the Poisson to have more uh, more variability than the Poisson. So uh, nothing fancy there. So zero inflation deals with many zeros in the data. In the, in the paper, we have a lot more arguments on, on why this is useful, but I won't be uh, going into that. And then the U is linked to the covariance in the IJ. So, likelihood, prior. So, I give some example priors here. So, for the, for the uh, what, what type of priors would you typically use in a, in a, in a parametric based setting, so to say? Because we, you have to understand, we're now in this, we, have, we want to use this inla software. That means we have to stick to the priors that this software allows. In the beginning, I would like to generalize later, uh, later on, I will generalize. But in the beginning, we have to stick to the priors that it allows. Well, these are the typical priors uh, for those of you uh, who have done some base that uh, will recognize the log of the overdispersion is Gaussian. 
uh, typically variance related parameters, so this is the precision, precision gets <coughs> gamma prior, fixed effects get the Gaussian prior, so very standard, but this could be in a... However, what is the challenging part for us is that we don't want to use... So an objective patient would use a flat prior all around here, that's not what we want. We actually want to estimate the parameters of the prior, so we're thinking empirical based now. So we, are, we want to estimate the parameters rather than assume them to be known or, or whatever. So we really think empirical based. And that of course is going to help us in the, in the data analysis later on. So the, the task is now, uh, from the data, how, we can, how can we estimate multiple, uh, yeah, multiple uh, sets, multiple uh, priors, uh, multiple prior parameters. So for those of you who are not so uh, acquainted with Bayesian shrinkage, because that's actually what's going on here. If, if, one, if you have non-informative priors, so flat priors, then you let the data do the talking. But once you start to use informative priors, then the prior has an impact on the posterior. Right? And so this is more like an illustration, it's not the... So basically, this, this is how you think of it. Um, is, is suppose that we, we think of this group parameter that we are mostly interested in, right? We think of the brain regions. Um, that would maybe get a, a simple Gaussian prior, but you could start with a very flat prior, so very low precision. If you then add the data, so this, uh, I mean, this is just an illustration, but this is how waves work. You, you add the likelihood, so, so to say, <coughs> then the mode of the posterior will roughly be very close to the mode of the likelihood. Uh, that not, always, not always maybe, but that's how you should think of it. So the prior has very little impact in some sense. Um, so there's no shrinkage taking place here. The, the, the estimate that you get back is, is similar to, to the estimate that you, that would be returned by, by maximum likelihood. If you, that's not completely true, but uh, as an illustration, if you put more informative priors, so um, then what you see, and you, you, you concentrate them on zero, concentrate them around zero, then what you see is that the estimate will shrink towards zero, and that is. Uh, and that is a desirable effect. That's what I'm, I'm, I'm going to explain. That is not, that's not a bias, it's a desirable effect in high dimension, if you have high dimensional data. Um, and obviously, if you have a, a very, very strong prior, then uh, you get a lot of shrinkage towards zero. In particular, of course, this all depends on the, on the sample size. So the larger the sample size is, the less the shrinkage effect will be. That's how it should work, right? The less impact the prior has. So why informative prior? There are many reasons for that. Uh, and I could give a whole talk on, on any of these reasons, I guess. But um, so shrinkage of dispersed, so shrinkage, so informative prior that 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 uh, implies shrinkage. And, and shrinkage of dispersion related parameters, well that's agreed upon, I would say, in, in the community that that's useful because you these are typically parameters that are difficult to estimate, dispersion related parameters. Uh, even if your data is, if your sample size is small, so you really want to borrow information across the future, the, the usual, uh, the usual uh, uh, thing that people say, and that leads to more stable estimates. Um, but also for, for your parameter of interest, it can actually be very useful. So um, think of your beta group, because as I will show later, it, 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 you have to actually do it if you think about multiplicity, so it accommodates multiplicity correction. And, all, and this is quite well recognized in the Bayesian community nowadays. But also, um, and that's something less well, yeah, it's, it's well understood, but not often seen. It also corrects for selection bias by, by, by you guys should mean. You have to, what, what, what biologists often do is that they do the multiple testing correct, and then they report, let's say, the top 100 genes or the top 100 tags that have the most, the largest effect. And they, they also, Report then the, the parameter, the log, uh, the log fold change, but they report the parameter. But that parameter estimate in there of the top 100, once you start doing selection, is not corrected for selection bias. Because there's a serious selection bias if you do the top 100 out of 70,000. So typically, these parameter estimates are too big. Um, if you do shrinkage, then also these parameter estimates will be, uh, will be shrunken. Uh, and so also you get a better estimate of the effect size. And that's something not always understood. Some people, sometimes people say shrinkage implies bias, 
That may be true on a if you do it row by row, if you, do if you just focus a priori on one data point, but on a selection, it's not true anymore. Shrink shrinkage is actually better than doing no shrinkage. Oh, I have a lot of examples for that. So you have to think of selection, select to the top 100 and something like that. <coughs> um, and then shrinkage of nuisance parameter. That is actually, I think, one of the nicest things in the Bayesian analysis. Uh, and we have a nice example of that. If you, for instance, batch effect, and suppose you have a very small, small experiment, and then you don't really know whether the batch effect plays a role or not. Then you have, to, in, a, in, a, in a classical analysis, you have to pay one degree of freedom for that, right? Uh, you can, of course, do model selection, but as, as you all know, in a classical setting, model selection and inference, they don't like each other. Uh, you have to deal with the uncertainty of the model selection. It's not so easy to, to, to tackle that. In a Bayesian setting, it's very simple, because if the parameter would not be important, then its prior would automatically uh, shrink, shrink, shrink very much to zero, and effectively that means that you have, although in a Bayesian setting you can't really talk of degrees of freedom, but effectively it means that you're, you can use more of your data for the parameter of interest. So it, it's kind of automatic model selection property. Um, Automatic weighting of how important a particular parameter is. That, that is really nice for nuisance. Okay. Um, so we have the task now to estimate these uh, parameters. Uh, parameters, multiple parameters of the prior. And what is the trick here? So um, what I would illustrate is uh, how it works for one particular uh, prior. So one particular prior that denote that by pi alpha theta. Um, and that's the common parameter of one particular parameter, uh, theta i, so where i was 1 to p. So alpha may be, uh, alpha may be kappa 1, kappa 2, or, or maybe tau, tau g, so the parameters of one, one particular file. And now, now think empirical base. So empirical base, you see the data, so that's yi, your data rows, as samples from a, from a common density, from a common density. Then the trick is here. What you can do is you can disintegrate your y. So it means you, you just condition on y. You condition on y, and you multiply, you integrate over uh, over a suitable uh, over a, a, a suitable measure mu. So this is just the usual conditioning argument. But what is this? What is this? Well, this is just actually a mean, right? This is just a mean over posteriors. So a mean, well, we know how to estimate it. We know how to estimate that empirically. We can just estimate it like this. So it's just a mean over all the posteriors um, with i running from 1 to p. And p is large. That's what we know. So in fact, and this imp important to say, important to say is that this posterior, so there's alpha here, but that the posterior may also depend on all the other prior parameters, right? Uh, posterior of one particular parameter does not only depend on its own prior, because all kinds of dependencies, but also on the other parameters. But we can write it like this. So the prior can be expressed in terms of the posteriors um, um, and both have alpha there. So in, in principle you have an equation. In principle you have an equation that set, tells you how the prior and the posteriors are linked. Well, uh, it's a chicken and egg problem here, because of course these posteriors these posteriors, they, they depend on the prior. You cannot do the posterior without the prior. So, so, yes, it's an equation, but it's not so easy to solve. Well, once you have the chicken and egg problem, um, so it was first, then you easily think of something like EM. Yeah? And that's what we do. So, uh, it's not an EM algorithm, but it's, it's a similar, similar flavor. Uh, so, what you would do is you, inili you initialize, initialize your prior parameter. So typically I would start with a very flat prior, very flat prior. So you initialize this, then you estimate posteriors. That's where we use inla. So we use inla to estimate posteriors. So we make one round, and then, um, but then we can actually let it work because what we do then, then we can, then we can, um, uh, we have all these posteriors. We have all these posteriors. And what we do then is actually, well, we can just sample from this empirical mean. We can sample from this, and we know that should look, in some sense, look, should look like, like this guy. So we sample from these posteriors, and then 
we have a sample from the posterior, from the, from, the, from the empirical mean of the posterior, and we know that samples should actually be a sample from the prior. And, and so what we do is then we fit the parametric shape to, to that sample, because we want the prior to be some, of some, some kind of parametric shape. So we fit the parametric shape to that sample, they have a new prior, and we can iterate. So graphically, it looks like this. You start with a flat prior. Uh, of course, you have the other priors as well for the other parameters. You add your data with INLA. Uh, you get your posteriors, all the only marginal posteriors. You merge the, the posteriors, as I said. It's just taking point-wise means. You get an empirical mean, which you parameterize. So you fit a normal to it, or you fit a gamma to it, whatever prior you want to use. And that is your new prior, and you get your new posteriors, and you iterate until convergence. And you see the shrinkage going on, because the posteriors, they, uh, yeah, they shrink. So, um, what, what, what is this problem? Yeah, what, what, what are the problems of this procedure? Well, the, the nice thing is that it, it actually allows to estimate multiple priors simultaneously. Because what you do is, okay, this is a step you do for each prior separately, but then you repeat it for all the for all the priors that you need, and then you update a new prior, and then so, so then in every every new application of Eli is under the under the, under the joint priors. Uh, we have a, a theory, small theorem there that says that. The, the procedure is approximately equivalent to maximizing marginal likelihood, so that's basically what conventional empirical base does. But importantly, and that's important from a computational point of view, or not just computational, this procedure needs only the marginal posteriors. And conventional empirical base is maximizing under the joint posteriors, which is much more hard to, to get and much more difficult problem. So it's an iterative procedure that only needs marginal posteriors, for which we have a good program maybe in that. So that, that is that is the yeah, the real uh, the real benefit of this. Uh, so the implicit dependency on priors of other parameters accounted for. This this advantage still is that you require specific parametric priors, namely only that can be incorporated in that. However, um, and I won't be I won't be um, I won't be discussing that a lot, but however what we can do we can actually extend it to allow Non even non-parametric priors or a mixture prior for one parameter that we uh, that we most interested in, and actually that's very useful because, um, as I will show later, we need this. For instance, we need this mixture priors to do proper inference. So priors that have a point mass on zero, for example, we need that. So we we do we do we, we do not only want smooth priors to use smooth priors. Uh, so, but the methodology allows to to include that. I won't I won't be discussing that. I will discuss the choice of the mixture price and what impact that has for the false discovery rate. Okay, well, if you have a procedure, you have to show that it works. Um, I won't discuss that a lot, there's a lot of details in the paper. But it, it, even to our, uh, I would say, amazement, it, it works very well. Um, so I, I did a lot of simulations. Uh, yeah, that's what you have to do in some sense, because then you know the truth. Uh, where sample sizes are really small, so sample sizes are small as two times five. Uh, cases with multiple multiple parameters that you have to shrink. We put in, so obviously in simulation we know the real effect sizes, we know really the prior, right? Because we put it in, and we put it in the data generating process. We, we've put in some heavy tailed prior like T4, skew priors, uh, gamma priors, and uh, yeah it really converts to the correct prior. So we really see if you iterate, iterate, at some point you get the correct prior back uh, really nicely, even with very small sample size. I, yeah, th this is just a conclusion, um, but once again in the paper there are a lot of uh, illustrations on that. Uh, okay, so that's just one, one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is what uh, does it do a good job on real data? Um, and how does it compare with the other methods, uh, even in a simple setting? Um, just a two-group comparison. Um, and so what we did is we, what we did a so-called database simulation uh, because yeah, simulation you can always set it up so that it does what you like. So, but but we do, did a database simulation. So we use the case data as a template. We resample from the data, 
we need to stratify for batch, that's not so important. And we ignore the other covariates, we create two groups, and then for 10% of the tags, we create an artificial difference. Yeah. So we really make sure that we sample from the null, because we sample very ra randomly, but then we, uh, we cre create an artificial di difference that says, okay, we add, uh, we add a small effect for 10% of the tags. So those are the tags that we should find, and we also know uh, yeah, so we know the true, we know the true, uh, true positives and false and, 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 the, and the true negatives, and we compare to the other methods. So uh, you, you can see the names here, and um, yeah, it performs really well. I mean, the, this is the ROC curve, false positive rate on the x-axis, true positive rate on the y-axis, and it does a really good job. Uh, I have to say there are of course two, there are two. Um, in, we differ from the other methods in two ways, so that's the shrinkage part, but also the way we, we model the zeros, the zero inflation. So this is not just only due to the shrinkage, but it's also, I think, to, due to a better model for the zeros. Yeah. But you really see that uh, whatever, whatever the reason is for, for practical people, this is important because it's just a better method in, in terms of, it seems in terms of uh, ROC. This is just, uh, yeah, I just, Something, another comment I like to make, because a lot of people draw the ROC curve on the, for the full range of the false positive rate. I think an ROC is only interesting, in a testing perspective, only for the first part, because it's only interesting when the false positive rate is small. Uh, so, anyway. Let's move on. For the real data, yeah, you never have the truth. For the real data, that's hard. So, but I, of course, in the paper, I, I, I discuss a bit uh, what it returns from the real data. And I made one comparison, kind of comparison, um, which with, with not so much really with other maps, but with other models. What we do is, is the following. So we we fix a false discovery rate. I'll get back to this to, to this thing later on, what it really is. But let's just think it's a false discovery rate. And then we look at, at how many uh, the discoveries we do for the case data, so for the group-wise comparison. And we have three three type of models. So, so this is our model. This is just a negative binomial, so not accounting for zero inflation. But all, it's all put in, this, in, the, in our model setting, so in order to have a, a fair comparison. So, um, and this is, a, this is another version of the negative binomial where they shrink differently. And basically what you see, so wh what I've done here is that I, I uh, for, for illustration, I um, divided the, all the data in whether they are on average very low counts, so have very low counts, or what, I won't define this exactly, or whether they are low count, medium count, high, high count. So these are the, these are the data with, with a lot of zeros and less zeros, and then these are the higher data. And then the number of detections that you make in each class. And what you see is that if you account for the zeros, you make more detections at a given false discovery rate, so false discovery is always below 0.1 for all the methods, you make uh, relatively, also relatively more detections in the in the low range. You make overall more detections, but also relatively more in the low range. And that that is really important for the practitioners because this whole promise of the sequencing data was in the low range because the microarray data, the, 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 the technology that they used to use, doesn't have very good uh, specificity there, so or sensitivity there. So the whole promise of the sequencing data is the low range, uh, the low count data. So they want to have. Uh, but anyway, I don't have the, the ground truth here, but it seems uh, promising. Something else, and then, and then I uh, move on to what this false discovery rate is about. So a final thing that we did is, is um, actually using a large data set. And I think this is a trick that is quite useful in general. Um, so what we did is we use a large data set. So this is a standard data set that a lot of people use, which has 128 samples. And we split it into two parts. We split it in a large part that we call the large benchmark set and a complementary small part. So this is just a two-group comparison. This, 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 this data set compares uh, uh, RNC for, uh, for, I think, people of African origin and Central European origin. So it's just a, a two-group comparison. And what I do is the following thing. So I, I want to compare different methods with it with one another, and so I have four methods, that, so the same four methods that I, that I had here. Um, I have four methods that I apply to the data, that I apply to the large data set, and, what I, and then I define a consensus collection. So 
basically that's just the intersection of the four where all the four agree that on the large data set there's differential expression. So these, there are these IDs, these features, that all the four say yes, there is a difference based on given a, a, a false discovery rate threshold. So that defines a benchmark that is fair because it's based on all four methods, right? And then, of course, what you can do is then you can look at the small set, which is the complementary set that you have set aside. You look at the small set and then you apply each method separately uh, and see which method reproduces best what you find in the benchmark set. And then what we see is that swing set reproduces best this consensus uh, collection. So uh, so that is nice because because. Uh, that's where the promise of this whole methodology is, is when the sample sizes are small, and we see that when the sample sizes are small, it, it's bound to reproduce better the, the large data set results than the other methods. Okay, um, something about FDR and the relation to the prior. So as I said before, um, even though it's basic work, I think you should think about multiple testing. Uh, how does it work? So, you have your null hypothesis, Think of delta as being zero, that you have a point null hypothesis. Um, in a Bayesian setting, you can compute your posterior uh, probability that, that uh, the parameter belongs to the null, uh, given your data. Um, of course, if this is a that means, of course, if this is a null, if this is <coughs> zero delta, that means that your prior has to have mass of zero, because otherwise it doesn't work. So I'll get back to that. But in principle, this, this posterior can be interpreted as a local FDR. So that's that what was introduced by, by Efron. Typically, in a frequency setting, you would you would um, condition on the test statistic, but in a Bayesian setting, you can just condition on the data. But uh, so it can be interpreted as a local FDR, uh, but but only when the prior is suitable. I get back to that um, later. Uh, this concept of Bayesian false discovery rate was into introduced, and there are many different Bayesian false discovery rates, but this is what I call a true Bayesian false discovery rate. There are versions of a Bayesian false discovery rate that are still based on p values, but they have this Bayesian flavor of, uh, of putting, a, putting a prior on the, on the, on the, on, on the, on the null hypothesis, on the, on the likelihood that the null hypothesis is true, but for the rest it works with p values. This is true Bayesian in the sense that you really work with, with posterior probabilities. So you work with so this is just, you have a threshold T, this is the number of discoveries, so uh, the, number of the number of times your, identity, your, 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 uh, your posterior null probability is smaller than T, so this is the number of discoveries, so that, that's a, like in a common but false discovery rate, and here is the false, uh, yeah, so let's say the false, the mass on the false, uh, on, on the null, so to say, the total mass of the null for those that, um, for those that were rejected. So it's a Bayesian false discovery rate. It has uh, analogies to the ordinary false discovery rate. It can be used as such. However, uh, I, I, I started recently. I started to think a bit more about it. What is it really? I, I used to work quite a lot on false discovery rate, so I wanted to understand what was going on. Well, for those of you who work on false discovery rate or have seen it, this is what ordinary false discovery rate is. Um, it's it's an expectation of the fall of FDP false discovery proportion. So. The FDP is, is just your random variable that um, that conditional on your data that expresses an estimate of uh, of V over R, the, 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 the false discovery proportion. And your FDR is basically the expectation of that under the data generating process. So uh, because yeah, thinking frequentist, you have to think about uh, regenerating the data. And of course, since this is Bayesian, the BFDR. Uh, it is actually an FDP rather than an FDR. It's conditional on the data. It's not thinking of repeating the data generating process. So it's conditional on the data. So it should maybe be called a BFDP rather than a BFDR. But probably for selling the whole stuff, it's better if you call it FDR than, than, than FDP. Um, but but it's important because because um, so a real a kind of a real a real FDR estimate would be this. So it would be to, to think about this. So what happens if you if you if you would be able to repeat the data generating process, which of course is not something you want to do in the uh, you, either you cannot do it even something like bootstrap is not something you want to do in a Bayesian setting because you have to repeat all the computations again and it's terrible. That's not something what we want to do. But what we do want to do is to understand. Okay, so uh, so this is this is actually an FDP. 
But if it's an FDP, we have to understand it's just a point estimate. So we have to understand what is the variability of that point estimate. So it does vary a lot if we would have repeat, if we would repeat the, the if we would be able to repeat the process. Because, because if it doesn't vary a lot, then we're happy with it. That means that okay, then then uh, the point estimate is a good proxy for what we really uh, what we would really like to have. Yeah? But if it varies a lot, yeah, then we have a problem because then, then it's just an estimate for this data. But if we repeat the process, we could get a completely different answer. So, so we have to think about the variability of that um, variability of that estimate. Um, okay. Um, so, uh, in, 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 the, in the interest of time, what we did so very quickly, we have a ratio. Uh, which is a nasty thing, but you can you can approximate variances of ratio by 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 the Taylor expansion or the delta delta method. And what we actually see, and that's the interesting observation, is that uh, the variance is likely to be small if if your so B naught is just the expected number of is just the expected number of um, detections for given t. So this is what B naught is. Um, if that is of order p, and if the mean number of um, so it's all about this covariance. So if things are independent, there's absolutely no problem. But if, there, if, if there's a lot of dependency, then, then it may become, a, may become a problem. But if this, 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 the, mean, the mean number of, um, let's say, features that any feature i has a covariance to, if that is of a less than linear order, then, uh, then you're okay. Then this, this variance uh, uh, goes, to, uh, goes to zero with p. And of course, you can have it's, it's basically just a competition between this covariance metric, this covariance, and uh, the, the mean number of squared. So it seems like let's put it this way: that that that, that if you make a reasonable number of um, detections for any t, the variance is likely to be small. So that is good to know. Um, yeah, I have to go through this very quick. But what we did, what we did is okay. Um, so our method was, was compared with others by, by, other men, by other people for the point null hypothesis. And the sad thing was, they were pretty positive about the method, but um, the sad thing was that for estimating, so they also looked at false discovery rate control, and for estimating uh, FDR they used the wrong prior. So they actually used the continuous prior with our, our methodology, whereas in the paper we say specifically, if you want to test a point null hypothesis, you have to use a prior that has mass on zero. It was sad, but it, it triggered us to, to, to think a bit more about different priors that you can use. Um, yeah, I, I think I should just skip to the, to the conclusion here. I tried many different priors. And it's very interesting to, to try it. I tried um, a, pa a full parametric prior uh, of different kinds. Uh, um, so this is a point mass and parametric. This is a point mass and... Uh, oh, sorry, this is a point mass and... and uh, Parametric with estimated parameters. This is point mass with a flat parametric, so spike and slap type of prior. And this, we even try point mass with non-parametric, where you need additional condition on the non-parametric. Um, so this is just some illustration of the type of prior that we use. Um, did a lot of simulations, a lot of things to to to, to compare the two. In particular, also for false discovery rate estimation. Uh, to cut to cut a long story short. Um, just use a point mass and a mixture of Gauss. Uh, that, that, that is, it's performing very well. It's performing um, for all, I have a lot of criteria, so it's important, that I think is still important to say. It performs well for false discovery rate. It's slightly liberal, that's maybe what you may expect for, for Bayesian method, but just slightly. So if you, if you target that the is 0.1, it maybe sometimes goes a bit over at the 0.1, but it's not bad, usually in all, even when, even, and that's important, you, even when the true effect size distribution is far from a Gaussian mixture, some, some, sometimes like gamma or, or a uniform, and even with the small sample sizes, it doesn't matter, it does the FDR job okay. Um, also, the performance is good, and that's very important for, for, for pessimistic people. If there is no signal, so if pi naught, the, 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 if there, is, there are no differential tags in reality, it also sees that, it doesn't detect anything. Area on the curve is very good, and the parameter estimates uh, is, is, are also very good, very accurate. So it's, it's a very, 
it was somewhat disappointing because we had a lot of um, yeah a lot of new proposals for type of priors um, with with non-parametric and trying to, to see if that would, would actually help a lot. We call that spike and fit spike and fit. They do all a reasonable job. Um, and they are certainly competitors for the for the mixer to Gauss case, but but yeah, in general, uh, that, that the simple parametric setting worked very well. So uh, we have to admit that that, that would be uh, in for for in practice for data analysis people would be yeah probably the choice. Um, so okay, uh, important to say is that that when our outliers in the data. Uh, of course, then it's a parametric method, so your FDR is not so good anymore. But it seems that it's better than uh, than of most other parametric uh, methods. So, in some sense, the uh, shrinkage and, and application of flavor help you to protect you a bit against the outliers. So, so to sum up, uh, and I haven't mentioned all of this, but, but it's just to give you an idea of what the, the minus and pluses are. Um, it's not stringent in terms of IVR control, but it's, it's doing a good <coughs> job. But it's not stringent, so if you very, uh, if you very, uh, if you find it extremely important, yeah, then probably you can only use this method. Um, shrinkage can, in principle, introduce a bias for peculiar features. So if, if you have very outlying features, uh, that is uh, not something we observe. Computing time is typically hours, so even though it's, it's a lot faster than MCMC, you still have to wait for a while. It's moderately, uh, moderately robust against outliers. And the pluses are really uh, better power, small sample size, very reproducible, has good model selection properties. Um, there's less bias when you are in the selection context. It's very versatile in terms of models and, uh, and study designs. It allows joint inference for multiple, param multiple parameters. So if you want to test uh, two nested models, and it can deal with missing values, I haven't uh, discussed that in itself. There's a lot of applications. There is software. Uh, software is on my website uh, called Swingbase. It has a vignette, so it has a lot of uh, manual stuff there. It allows parallel computing. Uh, and we're trying to extend this also in the network setting. Uh, my, my student is working on that, and he has got some, some very nice results where you can also use these shrinkage principles to get better estimates of networks. And uh, that's my story. Thank you for uh, listening.